Good evening, everybody. It's good to see you. I am Reverend Dave Ledford, and I am the pastor here at the United Methodist Church at Epsecon. I apologize for blocking our guest of honor, Jacob, here. But it's good to see all of you here and know all of you are there. This is a very special and important event, a very important conversation for the whole world to be having, so we might as well lead it, right? Because this conversation doesn't happen enough in the world, and so we're going to start it. We're here to have a conversation on accessibility and to open our eyes to the multifaceted conversation that that is, and to uh, open our eyes to look at the world through somebody else's eyes, and to imagine how other people are forced to live by the way that we build our buildings, by the way that we build our programs, and by the way that uh, the world around them looks. And so when we learn to look at life the way they must, and when we learn to look at the world through their eyes, then we can start to see where they may have some unnecessary obstacles and how we can make things easier for our fellow man, our fellow woman, our neighbors. And so, as I said, our guest of honor is Jacob Hackett. He's been putting this all together and he's going to lead us through this event and this conversation and he's going to talk to us for a, a little bit and then we have a video for you. So, Jacob, welcome and it's good to see you. First of all, thank you all for coming tonight. I am here to start the conversation, and the conversation starts with the South Jersey Field of Dreams. What are we? We are a handicap accessible baseball league for children and adults. It's a first of its kind facility located in Apsica, New Jersey. Uh, here is a video to show you more. I saw an article in the Fabulous uh, Circle magazine about a miracle lick in Atlanta, Georgia. And I read the article and I took it home to my husband. And I said, this is something you can do. Read this article. He read the article and he says, I'm going to do it. I've got Field and we thought it was a one-game deal, 
and found out that it was eight, eight games, and he just but we and he lived quite far away, and it might have been a, a bit of an issue, but when we saw how much he, he loved it. If your child doesn't want to do it, there's always that chance the child may want to come back. You have to try it. And this gives them an opportunity to be real kids. It gives kids a chance who would never be able to play in this game uh, just to see the look on his face and, and the excitement that he gets to do something a little more mainstream than he might have the opportunity to do. Just thank you, Mr. Fitter, James. Thank you probably do the volunteers, the sponsors, the money, the family, the friends. So thank you all. Yeah, it doesn't even matter, it could be 10,000 miles away. You know, just uh, the, the fun of it, the enjoyment of seeing him and the other kids. The other kids are great. Where would these kids be today if they weren't here? It fills your heart, you know, when you come up and see them. I just, thank you doesn't seem like enough. To have all the kids help, because I think you grow from it. The sex and people here are just wonderful. Yeah, it is. It's I saw an article in the uh, All right. Now one of our panelists is going to introduce Jacob who's sitting right here in the middle. Welcome, everyone. Thanks for being here today. I want to introduce you to my good buddy, Jacob Hackett, who I met, uh, I don't know, about five or six years ago at Dante Hall when I was performing. And uh, he knew everything there was to know about Frank Sinatra and Dean Martin. And I had told him about, I did, I'd done an event with a woman named Gloria Loring. And he goes, Gloria Loring? General Hospital. I said, how the hell do you know who Gloria Loring is? And uh, it, was, it happens to be Robin Thicke's mother, and he knew that. And I, I, I never met anyone, forget about his disability, I never met anybody with his age that had that type of knowledge and that type of recollection about just that type of music that I've been immersed in for so many years. So I've always been impressed with him and um, spending some time with him, especially today, I took the access bus with him today and I actually saw what he goes through to actually get here and go places and do things. So we got a whole thing, but I wanted to let you know that in, in just October of 2018, uh, he won the Donald Sykes Award. And also in um, April 9th of 2022, Partners in Policy Making program at Rutgers, he, he graduated, uh, it was an eight month course. And then um, the Russ Berry Making a Difference Award, he's now a, a, a Wall of Fame member. So give it up for Jacob and all his accomplishments. He's been DJing and doing radio with Ken Schaefer since 2016. And um, I know we have this connection with the Sinatra because his grandmother loved, uh, great grandmother loved uh, uh, Frank Sinatra. And I guess that was a way for her to connect with Jacob through her, through her years as she got older. So maybe Sal will share some stories about that later. But, but without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, Jacob Hackett, my buddy. Here you go. Oh, you don't need I, I got it from here. Uh, thank you, Dave. Thank you, everybody. Um, here is a picture of me when I first came home from the NICU, uh, uh, April, uh, August of, uh, of 2000. Uh, I was uh, four pounds. I failed the car seat test many times. And, and you know, I... I just, uh, you know, I'm happy to be here to share my story with all of you because, friends, part of my message tonight, we can all work on accessibility together. And I've brought panelists from Entertainment, Dave, Sal down on the end, Allie's a parent, Stephanie has worked uh, with the Garden State Film Festival, and we all have a story to share. And at the end of the night, I hope my message comes across clear that we can all work together on it, and accessibility needs to be done. So, thank you.
Yes, I do. Friends, we're going to introduce our panelists now, and as I speak your name, I invite you to uh, wave your hand, and then your friend Jacob is going to tell us a little bit about you. So uh, Jacob Hackett, of, first, of course, is first, and uh, Sal Valentini. Actually, I think, Sal, you're on the end. They might not be able to see you at home, so maybe you could lean in or, or come behind Jacob and say hi. So uh, Jacob, what can you tell us about Sal? I, uh, I travel by air very often, uh, all around the world, and um, I'm constantly faced uh, with people with challenges, uh, and uh, it's a, lot of, a lot is wrong with, uh, with the airline industry, uh, with the airport industry, with the rental car industry, the, the entire uh, uh, travel industry stands to be shaken up uh, by what we're, we're going to talk about tonight. Uh, so, yeah. Oh, I do, do. Would you like me to go now? I didn't. I didn't think. Uh... I got it. Wonderful. I, I'll start my time then. <laughs> so there's a lot wrong with accessibility uh, in the travel industry. Uh, Jacob has told me nightmare stories about hotels. Uh, and, and things of that nature, but like I said, on a, on a first-hand basis, pretty regularly, I see the challenges that some people face. Uh, it starts with just uh, uh, getting to the airport and checking in. Uh, Jacob uses a motorized chair that's specially built for him. Uh, it costs in excess of $25,000. Uh, I'm, I'm sure that anybody, uh, uh, people have seen a, a chair like this and think that they, if they've seen one, they've seen them all. No, they're, they're custom made. Uh, he has, uh, 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 I forgot what they're called, Jacob, but at your, uh, at your lateral. lateral supports that are positioned particularly to hold them in a certain way. Uh, if you've ever seen the, the line of wheelchairs at an airport, none of them offer any of that kind of support. Uh, no uh, uh, points to uh, secure the individual in the chair. Uh, there is a chair at the airport. It's called a straight chair, but we'll get, that, that, get to that in a moment. Because as soon as you uh, uh, check in and they've determined that your chair is going to have to go onto the plane, you have to now get through TSA security. Uh, the TSA has invested millions of dollars into x-ray technology and machines that are designed uh, to uh, uh, scan otherwise able people. However, uh, if you're in a wheelchair like Jacob is, you have to come out of that chair. Uh, in some cases, in some cases you don't. However, you, you are subject to a 20 minute plus search of, of your entire body. And, and there's no uh, special uh, uh, designation like a TSA pre-check where Jacob could go, uh, at, be looked over, have his background checked, and they would know that he, there's nothing he could possibly be hiding in his chair that he is not one of the individuals to look out for. So that's a tremendous inconvenience is the TSA, the security pre-screening. And now we get past that and we're at the gate. Jacob now has to come out of his chair because his chair is not going on the plane. His chair is going underneath the plane, meaning all of the lateral supports and his headrests and everything that keeps him uh, 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 breathing comfortably, sitting comfortably, all that is now out the window. Uh, he's put into a straight chair, which is not like a regular wheelchair. A straight chair, you're strapped in, you're held in tight. Uh, otherwise, Jacob would, would simply fall on the floor. Uh, so. 
once you're put into this chair, you're one of the first people to board, of course. We've all, we've all uh, seen that at the, at the airline gate. However, you're, you're one of, if not the last person to disembark from the plane. So let's say Jacob wants to go to Disney World, as we all do. I mean, it's the greatest place on earth. I don't need to say that. Uh, well, as soon as he lands in Orlando, he now has to wait while the pilot shuts the ignition off on the plane because it costs a lot of money. Uh, uh, airline jet fuel costs, uh, if you can imagine, if you've all seen the price of diesel, uh, you can imagine the, the price of jet fuel is very high. So they, they'll turn the plane off. There is an accessory air conditioner on the plane. However, if you are on a commercial flight like a JetBlue or a Spirit, there is 150 to 200 people and they're all jam packed in this small fuselage. And you're there for at least 30 to 40 minutes after the first person gets off the plane. So the Florida heat and the sunshine that it's so famous for will, will start to make you uncomfortable if the chair you're sitting in doesn't make you uncomfortable in the first place. We have the technology, we saw it on the Access Link bus today, to uh, uh, remove a normal seat from a bus and be able to give uh, uh, access to someone in a chair who needs their chair like Jacob, uh, uh, access to a track system to lock them in place. However, on airplanes, not only do we not have enough room for our own two knees and, uh, and our, our, our purses and our, on our little, uh, like they, they, they literally tell you, I think on a Spirit Airlines flight, it costs you $30 to bring an Altoids box onto the plane. <laughs> So, so you can imagine uh, they haven't made room for such a seat that can be unbolted from the floor, removed easily and stowed under the plane where uh, Jacob's chair can then take its place, which is the way it should be. It shouldn't be Jacob having to give up this specially made chair to sit in an airline seat. It should be the airline taking the ridiculously chintzy and cheap and crappy airline seat out and stowing it underneath their plane. So Jacob gets to Disney and he's very excited to get to his quote unquote accessible hotel, which Jacob can attest that not many hotels are precisely acceptable. Well, how is Jacob going to get to the hotel, right? You, you would think that there are uh, uh, programs like Access Link everywhere. However, you need to live in these municipalities to access uh, such help. And it's often difficult to book accessible travel. So wouldn't it be great wouldn't it be wonderful if one of the dozens of airport rental car services offered some type of accessible van? I was talking with uh, uh, Jacob's mother today, and we were saying, you know, um, well, you got to think, what is the whole reason why uh, uh, the airlines would rather put Jacob in a chair rather than unbolt a chair and put a chair in? Because that, that latter uh, move takes more time, and time is money, and accessible vans are expensive. However, you know, as, as someone who lives in a family with somebody with accessibility issues, you, are, you will absolutely pay whatever premium there is to make sure that your loved one is not only comfortable, but can enjoy themselves. And, and I think that, you know, in a first world country where, you know, in, in America, it, it, much unlike a lot of places in the rest of the world, we can travel very freely. It is one of our greatest attributes that in America you can get in the car, go from sea to shining sea, fly from New York to Los Angeles in five hours, board an Amtrak train, throw your car in the back and go from Virginia to Florida uh, overnight. A and that should be for everyone. America is rooted in equality, and that's just not equality on the color of our skin or our religious background. But our special needs, equality for people who can't have the same, who don't have the same level of access that we all do. Equality in terms of accessibility is tremendous. The ADA, uh, was it, uh, the, uh, yeah, yeah. The, the ADA has only gone so far 
to hold uh, uh, people accountable, but it's up to people like Jacob Hackett here tonight who have organized a meeting with his community to get the word out. It's up to people like Jacob to make a difference because it, 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 when it comes to accountability, there's a huge problem in this country. And these businesses really, really do, like the airlines and the rental car companies and, and uh, the hotels, they have a, a long way to go before there is an equality of accessibility. And so uh, I'm going to leave it there. It's just something that I see on a regular basis is poor people being fielded up at the TSA, uh, 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 poor people being left on a plane for a long time and, and being uncomfortable. And I think that's a real problem. So I, again, Jacob, thank you so much for having me here tonight so that I could, I could uh, speak on behalf of, of uh, the people who, who fly uh, on our airlines every day, or at least try to. You, you know, Sal, you bring a lot of valid points because you see these things that, you know, my mom may not see or anyone else. So I thank you for bringing those points up. And yes, uh, I believe I sent it to Reverend Dave and maybe the committee members in our group text uh, a couple of weeks ago. There was an article out there uh, JetBlue uh, would not let a handicapped woman on an airline be because of the very same issue. She had a wheelchair, and they wouldn't let her. And they, and they, uh, she had difficulty walking, and they, they, they gave her an arm and a leg just because, you know, the same old story. Airlines have got to do better. Yeah, you see people complain about Wi-Fi. Yeah, uh, Sal, truthfully, accessibility is more important than Wi-Fi. I mean, God forbid, you got to send a text message? Come on. People just can't sit there eating peanuts and watch the direct TV. <laughs> if life was that easy, I mean, come on. I'm... All right. Uh, next is a parent advocate. She's a fourth grade teacher at in Galloway Township School District, uh, Allie Southry. Hi, how are you? Um, I have a couple of slides to show you uh, some really cute pictures of my really cute kids. Um, I have a six and a half year old son who has um, global and developmental delays as well as um, physical delays. So um, in talking to Jacob, there's been a lot of things that have uh, I have found over the years that have become more and more difficult. Um, when he was in a stroller, you know, you face all of those things that, you know, typical parents with kids in strollers face. Um, most of the time, though, you can unbuckle that stroller and your kid can walk into the store and you can leave that stroller behind. Um, as our son has gotten older, we have found that um, even simple things like our Smithville Village, you know, understandably a historical area, but not accessible in that regard. Um, some stores are. Um, so when Jacob and I were talking, we were talking about the different parking issues that there have been. Um, and we were talking about um, one issue that we had in particular last year with uh, beach access. So my husband um, built uh, our son a motorized beach cart for him to uh, get on and off the beach after our backs sort of had it in the sand. I think all of our, it's hard for all of us to get through the sand, period. Um, and then, you know, if you can imagine carrying your six month old or your 12 month old uh, and how difficult that is on a hot summer day and then carrying your, you know, five year old or six year old. So my husband um, is very handy and he built a motorized beach cart for him, um, the big beach tires, uh, the sand tires. Uh, my husband uses a remote control and it gets on and off the beach. It's phenomenal. Um, <laughs> so we, had, uh, we found a spot in Margate at the Margate Library um, where we could park. And if you know that area, the Margate Library, there is one side of the parking lot that is for the library, very well managed, um, well, a lot of good signage. And then there's another part next to the pavilion. And there are two handicapped spots on the pavilion side. And there are handicapped spots on the library side. And those definitely say handicap library access only. 
Um, so we had parked at the that pavilion in the non-library uh, spot for a year of or summer of going on the beach, and um, the. The people were so kind. I had my, at the time, I think 44-year-old aunt with Down syndrome with us. They offered to get one of the lifeguards to drive her onto the beach, um, which was phenomenal, and she hated and loved at the same time. Um, and my husband had the cart, and the library worker, they have a volunteer in the parking lot. Uh, she was so sweet and so kind. I love that. That's so amazing. It's good for your son. So we had a wonderful time at the beach. Well, fast forward to the next year, we knew the spot we could go to. Um, and I do want to pause and say, you know, in regards to the same travel concerns, when you're doing anything, um, obviously as an adult or with your child with special needs, it takes a lot of um, nerve to do these things that are so easy for other people. Uh, it takes a lot of planning, in particular for us. Our son has medication that has to be kept cold. So along with our turkey sandwiches, we need to make sure that there's room for that in the uh, cooler as well. So we have that as a, you know, a, a concern. Then we have to think about how long are we gonna be there? Is there somewhere comfortable for him to sit? Um, is he going to be able to go down to the water? There's just all of these things that um, a typical beach trip, and we also have a 10-year-old daughter. With a 10-year-old and a 6-year-old, though there are other challenges, um, you wouldn't normally think about. So going to the beach and finding somewhere accessible and finding somewhere comfortable and finding somewhere where you're welcomed and you feel safe is wonderful for us. So we're very excited that following year to come back. Um, so we came back, we actually had my two cousins who I think they were about 19 and 14 at the time. Um, they came with us and they, um, we got all ready. They were very excited. They're from Dingman's Ferry, Pennsylvania in the Poconos. They're very excited to go to the beach. And we got down to um, the same exact spot, the same exact side. I'm a big rule follower. I'm a fourth grade teacher. Um, we don't park where we're not supposed to. I don't park in a handicapped spot when my son is not with me, though I have the tags. And often when my husband and I, who are able-bodied adults, when we're together, we don't often use the handicapped spots um, unless we need to for room, for getting him in and out of the car and getting his wheelchair in and out of our vehicle. Um, so we were all um, there, we parked on the, the correct side, um, and we were met with a um, handout from the volunteer at the library citing the Margate City Ordinance that handicap parking is not allowed uh, for beach access after being there the year before. Um, you can verify that it is, is an appropriate spot. Um, the Atlantic County comes out with a beach access guide. Um, the Margate City Library is named specifically in there as a place to park. Um, and she handed us the uh, information. She was as kind as she could be in the situation and let us know that she would absolutely be calling a private tow company to tow us if we continued to park there. Um, so... There was a lot riding on this. Um, number one, just getting up the nerve to take your whole family to the beach, A, B, with a special needs uh, child, and then with cousins who were very excited to come. Um, we don't have the luxury of, um, of saying, well, tow us, we'll see what happens. My son's beach cart is battery powered. If that, when, when that battery dies, um, that child has no way other than us carrying him to get back to the car. Um, so we ended up leaving for the day. I have a friend who's a Margate uh, police officer and I called her and I said, can you just let me know? Can you look into this? Um, I contacted Jacob. <laughs> well, Jacob saw, I think I had posted something. We have a public Facebook page. Um, and we talked a little bit and he let me uh, reach out or helped me reach out to some people on the Atlantic County Board of Disabilities. Um, I sent... Um, Dennis Levinson an email because his name was right on the beach accessibility guide that we were turned away from. Um, I did send an email out to him and I copied the, the head of the library um, as well as some people on the accessibility board. And I will say in um, a very short turnaround time, um, we got confirmation that we were in the absolute right spot, that there needed to be education done to the library volunteers and the 
the other library staff. Um, and they welcomed us to come back to Margate anytime. Now, I'll be honest with you, we found a very accessible spot in Ventnor, and I just, my heart can't take trying that again. Um, but just wanted to shed light on, even when things are done, um, even when there's a beach accessibility guide, um, even when it's laid out welcoming you to the you know, South Jersey beaches, it just takes one person to stop that for a family. And it was a really devastating experience for us. I mean, all in all, we were all healthy and happy, but we had planned our whole day around that. And it's embarrassing to a point. It's a little kick in the gut. Um, and I just think that, you know, we do do a lot, especially with our beaches for accessibility. Um, but we're so, so, so far away from where we should be. Hold on. Uh, next. Okay. Uh, next, uh, speaking, he's a he's a he's an uh, instructional aide at Atlanta County Special, Special Services. John Miller. Hey, everybody. Good, uh, um, good evening. I'm just going to piggyback on both these guys what they said. Um, one sp specific short town, you know, balloons in a couple weeks from 40,000 to like 400,000. And there's so many people to ask because I work very close to the back of the boardwalk. Um, it's hard to find access, the, the beach is accessible and there's only two or three, maybe four tops beach wheelchairs to take individuals down to the beach, but there's no water accessibility at all. Like they can't get in the water. Um, other places, other countries, other states have ramps that go into the water. We don't have any for Atlantic City or Ocean City, which is more popular beaches, Wildwoods and such. Um, I get a lot of people asking me where, where can they rent one, where can they buy one, where can they borrow one. You can get them in Ocean City, but you have to bring them back. So that person's stuck until the accessible beach wheelchair comes back. And I can understand the young lady saying over here, they're, they're even hard to push. They're not that easy. So there's got to be something sooner or later made that's going to be accessible for everybody to work. Um, the ramps, Ocean City is accessible. There's a lot of ramps to get up and down, but there's nothing to go to the beach. Obviously, the regular wheelchairs or even the, the motorized wheelchair that Jacob has, it's going to get stuck. Sand's going to get into the gears. It costs a lot of money to replace. It costs a lot for the technician to come and fix his wheelchair if it does break down from the sand and oil. So that's something that's very tough that we've been speaking to a lot of beach guys about is getting more chairs maybe donated or built so they can even get down to the beach. Um, I for one have been seeing this a long time where people really want to get into the water to say, John, how can I get in the water? And they just can't. So it's tough for a lot of folks that really, really want to go into the water. Um, they're investing a lot of time and money in other things. But you have a lot of folks that come down that are individual special needs. And top it all off, there's only one handicapped spark parking spot on every road, one. So you can imagine how many cars and how many people I see a day. In my parking lot alone, I see 100 cars a day. And if their needs are handicapped accessible, I, I valet the car and do it myself. I hold their keys. We put them up in the lot. We make them go all the way up to the top. So we take care of them ourselves. We took it upon ourselves to do that because there's not enough. There's just not enough handicapped places to park. Um, the resorts are trying, but I think more people need to advocate and let them know. I think more folks have to let people know that these folks want to go to the beach and enjoy themselves like, like everybody else does, but they get stuck. Once that wheelchair goes in again, it gets stuck, and then you got to bring it back. So Sal's family might want to use it. Kathy's parents might want to use it. Somebody wants to use that chair, it's got to come back. That's the downfall to that. They have a few. They don't have a lot. Um, that's really about where everything is on the beaches right now. I know they're trying to build them. Uh, there's grant money that's starting to come out for accessibility. Um, I wasn't aware of that handout that the young lady was saying about the beach accessible. That's really good to have. And like she said, hopefully it all tells the truth about where everybody needs to be. Um, but like I said, we, we definitely need more beach wheelchairs to get to the beach. 
Uh, everybody needs a chance to enjoy the beach somehow. E even lakes, there's just no access to, to, to the nice lakes that we have um, <clears throat> to get there. Um, Jacob, anything you can ask? accessible beaches or not, but, but I mean, just think of somebody like him. Well, they have, when, what's the unlocking of uh, the beach this Friday? He probably has to put his reservation in for a beach chair. He has to have two adults to bring him down. Hold out for Accessibility for the sand. That, that blows me away that it's as simple as a map over the sand. Stops are probably the most difficult yeah. parts to traverse. That makes a lot of sense. Well, Sal and John, um, Ken Shaver and I knew a woman, know a woman, excuse me, who. Um, she she was a, she's a strong advocate for uh, beach mats and beach beach access in the city of Brigantine, and she she was actively um, pursuing the idea of putting a beach mat in Brigantine. It's it's uh, only limited to a couple of streets. If somebody, I don't know the exact streets, but I do know for a fact it's only a few streets in the city of Brigantine. The Wildwood Beach and Ocean is so far away. I don't even know how they get down. Um, I know we've seen that they have something called a truck taxi and they have golf cart taxis that'll take you down, but there's no place to put a wheelchair for any family member to go on there. So I can't even imagine how tough it is to go to Wildwood to be maybe a vacationer who doesn't know out of state or out of even the country. A lot of Canadians do come down. You know, you know, to Wildwood, and they don't know, oh, I have a, a grandmother or my mother needs a wheelchair. They don't even have that in Wildwood right now. So. And, and like I said, you have, you have people coming from places where, that are more accessible, you know? Uh, and it, it's almost kind of crazy that there isn't some sort of at least national standard. Uh, uh, there are global standards for, for things like I like the price of gold. However, there's no global standard for accessibility. But at, at the very least, a national standard that once you cross this country's border, from, from that border until the next, there is, there is a, 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 a uniform level of accessibility. And, you know, uh, one of New Jersey's biggest draws is tourism, I'm, I'm going to assume, for tax dollars. So, you know, that's, it's got to mean something. Jacob, thank you for having me. I appreciate that. Okay, I was lucky enough to have Kathleen half a year before the world shut down. Uh, we had a lot of fun. I was lucky enough to work at Shore Medical Center in Summers Point. Um, and uh, 
at the school's board office as the receptionist intern. Kathleen will tell you a little more of what I did and what she did working in the work program. Hello. I'm so happy to be here tonight. And as a lifelong teacher, I believe that education is the answer to developing solutions to these problems. So I'm very thankful to Jacob for putting this committee together and to really start the conversation uh, about accessibility. It is hard, you hear even just learning from each other, the stories that are out there. Uh, my experience is in, I worked for special service, Atlantic County Special Services as a, a community-based teacher and that's when I was lucky enough to have Jacob for during the half year of my 33rd out of 34 years of teaching. So I always tell him I got right on, in under the wire to get Jacob Hackett. Uh, in that program, the students are working in different um, job settings in the community. Jacob was already working at Chore Medical Center when I started working in that program and had a job set up and he had gone through a process of developing that job. Um, when I was, when he was in my class, then he moved on to a job in our school office and um, that job was built on his experience at Shore Medical Center, also in his interest and his skill level, and uh, mostly his collaboration in his own uh, future and interests. And so I would say that the most important thing, in my opinion, of, about uh, developing programs that meet the needs is the collaborative process. And when I hear everybody's story here tonight, I think of how a group together has so much more power than standing alone. Um, but for our collaboration, uh, Jacob actually worked with another teacher, Heather, Heather Muller, and an OT therapist. Uh, Kevin Curran and a, a job coach and an individual support person. So we had a team uh, plus child study team and we had a team of people together to come up with solutions to problems that might arise. And because of that and because everybody's unique experiences and what they could bring to the, to the table, so to speak, uh, Jacob was able to have a very successful position in the office, um, the administrative office at special services. I think there might be a picture, yeah. And this is the picture of Jacob before any of the changes were made in the office. The decision was made, he accepted the, the job, and then the, um, any type of barrier that had to be overcome, we got to work. And this shows um, the first thing, some of the, the, the thing about it is what I hear from all of these issues, some of the solutions are very simple, a beach mat or a, a, something that somebody who just reads the right book or knows what they're supposed to do. So the solutions aren't always complicated issues that have to be overcome. Sometimes it's just almost common sense. But when, when Jacob started there, he, had, he has this great chair that supports him in every way and we, need to, we didn't need to make room for that. And so the first, um, the first order of business was to see how he could best access the work area. So a drawer was removed and I think they took out those cabinets above because he wasn't gonna be using those and it just opened up the space. A lot of the equipment was moved so that he could um, access it rather than, it's a two room office, rather than going back and forth between the office and the other room. All the equipment was moved. Um, Jacob, you can jump in if I'm forgetting something. Yeah, the equipment was moved. Uh, the copy machine was in there. Um, copy machine. Uh, the the um, where the you the um, where you slide the envelope through that was moved. The mail machine. Um, the, the mail machine. Thank you. Um, um, the mail machine. Everything was moved so that way I didn't have to jump between the copy room and back. I could scan a driver's license right behind me. Everything, the, the school was absolutely phenomenal in the six weeks. And I know she can't be here tonight, but I have to give kudos to Regina Wilkins. Uh, yes, Regina was instrumental. She was great. Uh, so this whole process was basically a trial and error. What worked, what didn't work, how Jacob could not just make the office work, but feel comfortable, have easy access, not just 
access, but easy access, the way an office should be. And um, it, it, really turned, it really turned out great. It was the last, some of the, of the equipment that we had to order, I think there was a, uh, Marianne's here, an OT. I think we needed to order a special stapler. We had to order some different, we had worked with, the, with Kevin, the OT, to, to just get equipment that is fairly easily available but just didn't happen to be already set up in that office. So, of course, Jacob took the, he took the lead. What do you need? How, what's gonna make you comfortable? It's a, it's a process, it's a team approach. And I, I feel that that's the only way that you can really create an environment that fits a, each unique person. Um, I did wanna say the one equipment that was not high tech but low tech was the, was the headset, and we were trying to decide what's the best way, because Jacob was answering the phone, using all those great skills that he has, and uh, representing our school with everybody who called. But a uh, headset for his, um, so that he could be attached to the phone, was a question. Is it gonna work? Is it gonna be what is need for you? But you had to try different things. You had to see if it worked. You can't just, somebody else can't make that decision for you. You have to work together to make the decision and make it work. Um, I'm gonna say that in addition, creativity, we're, we're living in a world already that's creative, so we were able to, after that sad half a year and the, and the um, world shut down, everybody got creative. So let's put that creative, the ability to make creative decisions. Right now, we all know people who are working from home, so three days a week, four days a week, they're having these setups in their home. There's a lot of ways to be creative that we didn't think two and a half, three years ago were available, all the smart technology. There's, there's just so much out there. So in my opinion, I feel that it's, it's about bringing it all together, having national standards or standards of some state standards, some standards where people are given the access and the use of the technology and the use of the um, accessibility to, to access their, what, whatever their choice is, the beach, the office, the, you know, the library, wherever it is. And I think that's, that's the issue. So I'm excited to be here today as a starting point. Um, I put my, as my last choice, my last uh, bullet is commitment because I think the commitment of our country to making these changes, if that, would, if that is what happens, the commitment is there, the solutions will follow. And they're not, they're, it's not that complicated. So I want to thank Jacob for having me here tonight. I'm excited to be part of this panel and to get to be part of this conversation. Next, I would like to introduce, and I'm glad she is joining us tonight. I, I worked. Well, I was a part of Dante Hall with her and Dave almost, what, five, five summers ago now. And she just um, asked me to be a part of the Garden State Film Festival uh, ADA committee. And uh, during her presentation, uh, speaking of transportation, Stephanie, my mom, and I went on a trip to was supposed to be Asbury Park, New Jersey. Uh, we went from my home in Absecon all the way up to ha Hamilton, New Jersey. They told us Hamilton would have to take you to Hamilton. Hamilton would take you to Asbury Park. Uh, friends, that makes no sense. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I just have to not only thank you for having me be a part of the ADA committee this year, but thank you for experiencing that nightmare of a day with us. <laughs> it was fun. It was an adventure. It was an adventure. adventure. First, I really just want to say that I think it's hysterical that Jacob attended so many shows that now he believes he worked at Dante. <laughs> <laughs> um, I love that. <laughs> I probably should have given him a job. Um, so um, we met Jacob um, back in 2014. I, I met Dave and we discussed the possibility of putting together a revival of the 500 Club due to mutual interests. Um, 
a lot of people in this room um, may have met my grandfather, whose orchestra was the house band for the 500 Club for many years. Dave was already playing that kind of music, and it was kind of kismet to come together and put this show together. And so the next year, we put that show on, um, and Jacob, uh, this is my signal to go to the next slide. Um, <laughs> Jacob attended one of the first shows that we put on, and he was a fixture ever since. He is a theater manager. I'm an artistic director, but I've been working in nonprofit arts um, for the last 15 years. But he was a gem. If everybody who loved theater or music attended as many shows as Jacob did, Theater would be in a great place right now. <laughs> um, but it was a pleasure to have you continually be there. But because of my position at Dante Hall, um, I had a unique perspective to run a nonprofit performing arts center and see the challenges that we had. Um, initially, with um, our building, it was built in 1924. Dante Hall Theater was the parochial school adjacent to St. Michael's Church. And because of that, they were two separate buildings, but they were not ADA compliant. And the church, being deemed a historical building, did not want to make any of the reserva uh, the, the um revitalizations, the um, refurbishments that were needed to bring it up to standard. So what they thought they would do, once um, there was a Ducktown revitalization effort going on and funds were available, the CRDA committed to a $3 million overhaul of Dante Hall Theater. They wanted to convert the, the abandoned school, which had closed in 1988, um, in the year 2000, they put in this money and we refurbished it into this beautiful theater. Um, that being said, they connected the two buildings. So they connected the theater with the church um, and created all of the access points that were missing. So I'll get to that in a second. Um, because the theater really was a mecca for performing arts that had nothing to do with the casinos. It was a really beautiful offering. And we had everything from, um, from big band, as you can see. Um, Dave has been on our stage many times and has brought the majority of our patrons to the theater, which I'm grateful for. But we also had, we had punk music. We had musicals. We did theatrical productions. Um, and we also did a lot of uh, community and political events at the theater. It really was a home for the community. But when you think that you're providing this space for the community, what really needed to be thought of was an accessible space. And a lot of things that the building did not have, that the church did not have, were those access points. So when they refurbished Dante Hall, they added um, an exterior ramp that ran up to the front entrance. They built um, ADA compliant bathrooms with access, um, wide stalls, access for wheelchairs. There were no electronic doors though, and so it was still cumbersome. And if anybody has gone to a show at Dante, you know how heavy those front doors were. And so if you're thinking about somebody who's arriving by themselves, after they've gotten up the long ramp, they better pray that somebody's nearby to open up the door for them. And it's just, it's, it's little things that people think, okay, we found the solution. And they do something quick and they haven't really thought of it. Because even as something simple, like when you get that door open, there's a lip that you need to get over. And some chairs don't comfortably make it over that lip. That's something that nobody thinks about. When you, um, I think it's on my next slide. When they ordered the chairs for the theater, they went with a mobile chair. They were not conjoined like normal theater chairs are. They didn't do graduated seating because they were thinking if we have a solid floor space, we can move these chairs, we can make it accessible for people, we can remove them from the aisles for those that are in wheelchairs. We can make it very comfortable for people, we can widen aisles. If need be, we kept our egresses to at least three feet, 
but the chairs themselves have armrests. And just because you're not possibly in a wheelchair doesn't mean that you can sit comfortably in those chairs. Not everybody fit comfortably in those chairs, and that wasn't taken into consideration. So those chairs actually wound up being quite cumbersome for several of our guests who needed more space even to sit. But we did clean up all the way to the, um, to the left of the photo that you're looking at. There was an elevator lift that even though it was regularly um, inspected and approved, they did not see that every time that lift was raised to stage level, I had to physically climb into it from the stage and then jump up and down to get it back down. So I'm sure you can imagine how much fun that might be for somebody who is required, they need that lift to get down and me comforting them behind while I'm jumping up and down saying, don't worry about it, you're gonna be fine, we're gonna get down, I swear. <laughs> it was, it was, it's just not, it doesn't make sense. It wasn't comfortable, it wasn't well thought out. Um, we did have an elevator to get through the floors. Like I said, those were really the only accommodations though that were made. And that actually is what satisfied with the church being ADA compliant. There was an interior walkway now on each floor so that the church could say, well, we have an elevator, we have an entrance ramp, we have um, compliant bathrooms, they're just in the building next door. So that they didn't have to structurally change their building. And I'm not putting the place down because I love that theater, that was my home. But there were some serious issues that weren't thought of. And that, that started to change when I um, became one of the board of directors for the Garden State Film Festival. And so what I started to realize was that as a board member um, who was asked to, we as board members, we all had to chair our own committees. And a passion of mine was ADA compliancy and uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. And my feeling was that I had no right to be the chair of this committee. But what I could do is reach out to people who could give me the perspective that's needed. And what I really feel like where Dante, the, the board of directors, the original founding members of that theater um, could have benefited is if they had added more people with the proper perspective that could have given them the guidance necessary to make the right choices when they were purchasing things and not just going by what they thought was needed for the building. With the Garden State Film Festival, it's almost like a flip. So now I'm not running a venue. I'm actually setting up shop in several venues throughout Asbury Park. And part of our mission is to go to each of these venues and to make sure that they meet the requirements and that they have the ease of access. And so when I began um, starting the, putting this committee together, I contacted Jacob and asked if he would be interested in being one of my advisory group members. And I consider him the most valuable member of this committee because not only did he say, absolutely, I'm right on board. I'll do it right away, everything. I think anything that anybody asks Jacob, oh, I'm so sorry, I'm gonna wrap this up. But I appreciate that Jacob said yes because not all of these venues fit it. We fit thousands of people in there and we're, they're not all accessible. So I'm gonna click through because there was a theater that we were using for years that did not meet those requirements. They thought they made some changes just like Dante and they, they, we had to stop using them because their access points were ridiculous. Jacob has told me horror stories about having to go through kitchens because it was the only ground level access point for some of these buildings and they just don't think of those things. So I think that um, even in the arts, there need to be more people with the right perspective that have that, that hands-on experience with those things. We have done things to our website to be more adaptable. We have reconfigured our entire ADA policy um, to be more understanding and inclusive of what we offer, trying to be as thorough as possible. Um, 
we have um, grievances uh, for people who feel as though there are changes that, that need to be made, and we try to make that very transparent as well. But I just want to thank Jacob for being a part of this committee and for all that he's done for all of us, because we're all fans of Jacob's, and you inspire us to be better. So thank you. Next, Stephanie worked with him at, the, at Dante Hall. I met him over close to five years ago. I'm so thankful that he and Sal and all of the panelists agreed to help me tonight. Please welcome Dave Namiani. Thank you, Jacob. I wanted to say um, I basically most of the time live in Los Angeles, and I guess it was about eight or ten, maybe twelve years ago, that we started noticing when you walked into a restaurant, it said an A, which meant that was a very clean restaurant. You guys know what I'm talking about, where where like they have the great the, the rating systems for the cleanliness, the health code. If it was a B, you're like, yeah, maybe I'll eat here. If it's really, really good, you know. <laughs> if it's a C, it was red, you're like, guess what? I ain't eating here if it's a C. And there is no D's. If there's a D, then that means the health department closed you down. I can't believe that there's not something like that for uh, accessibility, where you could go on to, and we talked about this, but where you could literally go on to a website or something for a restaurant or for a theater and just see like how I said, let's not, you know, you told me some horror stories about going to old hotels or there's some things that we can't change. There's some old hotels and some old historic buildings that maybe we're not able to change. But it would be amazing if we at least knew if a place was completely like 100% accessible for, for, you know, a variety of people. And um, I, you know, I'm glad um, former mayor of Atlantic City and, and state senator Don Guardian's here tonight, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I, I'm hoping that maybe there's some way to maybe introduce something like that, where we could have some sort of, you know, ADA. I don't want to say compliance or just recognition of something or of a of an organization or business where you can, you know, know for a fact when I show up. There's a ramp. When I show up, there's a handicap accessible bathroom. When I show up, I know that I can get in and out of there, that there's a mechanical door. I mean, I watched today, I, was, I went to Jacob's house and we rode on the, on the bus together, the access bus with me and Sal, and I saw Jacob's mom pick him up and carry him down steps to put him in his chair. And she carries him upstairs to his, his room. And thank God that his mother's in amazing shape that she can do that. But, I mean, to go out and try and, you know, he's, you're, how, you're 22 now, right? 23. 23. You know, we're ready to go out and start meeting some ladies at the bar. So we need to find some places <laughs> where we know we have some accessibility. So without getting too crazy, I mean, I, 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 totally, I totally understand that uh, not every business can, on the flip of a dime, you know, all of a sudden be aware of all these other issues. Hey, you, you like that, you're ready, huh? <laughs> you're ready. I'm gonna see if Memories has a ramp, because... <laughs> no, but, um... Jacob, if you wanna go there, I'll carry No. But I'm, 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 hoping, I'm hoping that we can all kind of come together. I, you know, I was just with Sal. We went to Costa Rica. Sal brought me down there um, for a show that he had. And I noticed it in the bathroom, in the, in the, by the ballrooms. I, I went into the, because we, we're talking about accessibility. There's a handicap stall. I popped my head in just to kind of take a look. They had an emergency switch in the bathroom that if you hit it, it was almost like a life call situation. I've never seen that in, in America. I, I mean... Outside of a hospital, but all the bathrooms, the public restrooms in Costa Rica, for whatever reason, had the handicapped bathrooms had this uh, this switch that was like if you were to fall or something were to happen, and that doesn't exist here. So how could that be? I, I just, you know, I mean, I'm, I, I, look, I don't think about it as much as I should, I maybe mean, because I, I don't have to take care of someone that has accessibility issues. Um, I've been pretty blessed that 
I don't, I mean, not blessed, but I just haven't had to think about it. But when I'm with you and I spend time with you and I, we had lunch one time with Ken and I just saw the difficulty just getting you up into the boardwalk and, you know, getting into a chair. And it's like, if there is a way to know 100% that the place is completely safe and completely compliant, it should be recognized in a way where that should just be something that we just, it should be a, an, an award we give away to a business or something. There should be something, I'm not sure what it is, I'm sure Don's gonna figure something out, hopefully, but there's gotta be something that we can do as, and, and listening to everybody talk, I, I, I thought all the points were amazing, and I thank you for having me on the panel. Jacob, you're a great friend, and you're a great visionary, so I think we'll just keep going with this, so. That's all I got. Now, it's time to play a little game with the audience. <laughs> I had to get the audience included somehow. Let's, what we're going to do is there are slides of pictures, I believe, that Reverend Dave and I found on the internet. That Reverend Dave and I found on the internet. You, the audience, I will, Dave and I will call on you, or, the pa or a panelist will call on you, and he, he will come up with what's right in this picture. So let's start. Uh, this first picture was a, a bathroom I was in in uh, North Carolina a few weekends ago. What is right with this picture? That's one, uh, Donna. Correct. Don? Correct. They changed the toilet paper. I didn't think of that, but that could could be true. Uh, yes. But I can't. See. Yeah, I can't see too good in the picture. But it's a sanitizer. What is it? Hand sanitizer. Or it is. Uh, okay, it is a, te a telephone. Thank you. Next. Doesn't look very wide. Right. It's a slider door. Okay, M Mom, did you, would you like to say anything? <laughs> okay, uh, next next picture, please. Zach. Correct. Correct. <laughs> Shower finger, I like that. <laughs> okay. Um. I would say easy access for the soap. You use the soap Oh, okay. 
Yeah, good one. Um, uh, next slide, please. Oh, this is the Sal and Dave. You can talk about this one because this is when you were in Costa Rica. Yeah, I was just saying that you know I think it's pretty cool that they have an emergency button in the bathroom. You know, I mean, I've never seen I've never seen that before. So, no. And. <laughs> and funny, I oh, that's not too good. Uh, I thought of this. I thought of this with the last photo as well, with the shower. How the seat seemed a little too far from the, uh, the soap dispensers. And it seemed as if you'd have to lean forward quite a bit to access the soap dispensers in the previous photo, and it could cause you to fall from your chair. If you don't have someone with you helping you, that could be an issue. Like here, this is such a, uh, uh, an incredible step, like Dave said, in the right direction. Oh, sorry, sorry, that sorry. There, that there is an emergency button. Uh, however, it does seem a little high. Should an emergency arise if you're in the bathroom alone? It's also behind you. And yeah. it's also behind you. Yes. Maybe it should be like on the floor on the baseboard. <laughs> well, I guess you would see it coming in yeah. to the bathroom. You'd see the button there. You'd know where it was once you sat down. But if you were to fall, you'd likely fall forward or fall to the side. Right, right. Right, Alice. Right. So, so, right. We have we have AI. We have AI these days. I don't know. I don't know if anybody here uh, uh, has uh, has an A L E X A at home. Every time the name is said on television loud enough, she responds with, "How can I help you?" So, you know, a, a, a vocally guided device. Could, could help you. But again, it, it comes back to standardization. Here we have a toilet with a bar behind it, no bar beside it, no vertical bar. But there's an emergency button, a call button. You know. Maybe you have to lean back and hit it head. <laughs> well, funny, uh, funny story. Uh, this happened when I worked with Kathleen out at Shore. I was. I was in the bathroom and I had my arm on the the uh, rail and I just just so slightly touched the the button to call for help and the nurses came in in the bathroom. Is everything all right in here? I came back. Oh yeah, everything's fine. Uh, next uh, picture, please. Oh, this is a uh, will be a newly designed. My dad sent these to me, a newly designed uh, ADA compliant Dunkin' Donuts in Manahawken. Had me at Dunkin' Donuts. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, point out. I, if I remember correctly, he said that the doorway was wider, the, the bathroom was, the doorway, the bathroom. I can't remember what else. The parking lot. Oh, pr yeah, probably. Parking lot, ramps, doors. doors. So, so you see, now, now your everyday chain restaurants are actually getting in the game here, and they're actually wanting to do something. So bravo the Dunkin' Donuts. Uh, next uh, picture. Yes, you may. Uh, uh, yeah, yes, Alice, uh, uh, please. It's Wawa to go to the ATM machine. It was, but now that I have, it's very difficult for me walking with the, the, with the walker, there's two sets of doors to go in. They're both very heavy. And if you 
go to push it, then you're, you get caught between the two doors. They come back. I wound up with bruises on my, both my arms. Uh, if nobody's there, some people will just stand and look at you. They won't even help you. It's ridiculous. I mean, you could see a cashier standing there. I mean, I understand they're behind the counter and they're very busy, but um, I had to stop going to use an ATM. So now uh, I have to use a, a cash a check in order to get cash, you know, and then you, and you have to pay for your checks. So, <laughs> so it, that was one of the things. And, you know, I used to run into Wawa just to get a few things, but it's just too difficult now. The other thing is many restaurants, they claim that they're handicapped accessible. They are not. Oh, yes. Uh, my grandparents, my mom, my, my pa parents, we were at a um, Texas roadhouse in Ma Massachusetts, and um, they tried to get me under a table, and couldn't, I could not fit a wheelchair underneath the table, too low. Um, tables were too... Uh, close together. Um, Alice and Marie, would you like to say uh, anything? I know Marie wanted to talk about uh, storefronts, and Alice wanted to. Yeah, it really is. And, you know, back to uh, what, what the focus of tonight is, friends. You know, we want to get something done. This is why I've brought people from all over different categories. You know, uh, when Reverend Dave came to me in uh, the week after I spoke at ACCC and said, would you like to have the opportunity to do this over again? I thought, first of all, my message, when I spoke at ACCC, and Barb Sabbath is in the back, my grandparents were there, they, their focus was solely on education and accessibility. Uh, you've heard stories from everybody tonight. Accessibility just doesn't fall under one plain category. Accessibility follows everywhere. And tonight, my friends, it's time we get something done. Thanks, Jack. Amen. Well, and yes, I agree. If you're not church, that means I agree. Thank you. Let it, let it be so. So uh, we're going to go now into... Uh, well, one thing that uh, you'll know if you live as Jacob lives, and those of us who have gone on travel visits with him, um, you don't just get up and go when you want to, and you can't just leave when you want to. If you want to stay, you can't just stay. So Jacob is getting picked up in about 20, 30 minutes. <laughs> and so uh, thank you all very much, all of our panelists, for being on such a tight schedule. Yes, this is time for uh, questions. Yeah. Hey, this is great, by the way. Jacob, uh, doing a great job. You know, it's important for that. But I have a by example. I want to ask a question. So we talk about disability or accessibility, sorry, uh, to the beaches, employment, education, and so forth. And so um, I represent families who have children with special needs. And we had a call from a, a parent out in Ann Arbor City who needed to get a ramp their own personal home, and it, it, uh, the price tag for that ramp was five grand, and the parents just didn't have that kind of money. So um, we looked, trying to find resources where that we could be able to find that. Unfortunately, we came up short, but with some creativeness, um, we were able to 
resources, but that was a one deal, and I'm thinking about the next time somebody calls and says, um, you know, how, how do I get a ramp installed because I, I don't have that kind of money. I know the Carpenters Union, you know, have, have, they donated some time in the past. I've heard about installing wooden ramps, but this was a, a situation where they couldn't have a wooden ramp. This had to be an aluminum one. Anybody want to maybe comment yeah. on that? So the question is, uh, just looking for some resources for building funds for building things like ramps. Uh, we have an expert here who may have, be able to answer you. Donald, I don't know about expert. Hi, everybody. My name is Donald Campbell. I'm the executive director of the Atlantic Center for Independent Living. We're a resource center, advocacy center, and support center for people with disabilities all uh, in Atlantic County. We help people with disabilities find answers to things like this. We advocate for people with disabilities. We connect them with resources and we help them get things like social security. So, and Jacob is on my board, which, you know, if anybody has any embarrassing stories about Jacob that I could present at the next board meeting, please let me know. He also has my birthday, so, you know, there must be some, I have CP too, so it must be like a CP January 24th thing <laughs> where we all, you know, so. But I love this event. To answer the question, so it goes to accessibility. So unfortunately, um, I would send them our way and I will give you um, our, my information as well. But a lot of times people think things like ramps are covered by Medicare or some other resource, but a lot of times they're not. Sometimes Medicaid will get it, but Medicaid is, you know, you gotta give up a lot of your income to be on Medicaid because it's poor people. Um, in poverty, you can't have more than $2,000 in savings. So a lot of people, there are a lot of programs out there, and when we're talking about accessibility, we're not just talking about ramps and all that other stuff, but we're also talking about these programs that are not really fully funded or fully designed to help people live independently. So I, you know, we'll see what the situation is with this ramp and see where um, what we can do to help, but a lot of times people think there's these programs out out there, but there's not. And when you're looking for things to advocate for, these are things that we need um, help with, getting these programs to cover what they're supposed to cover. Getting Medicaid, which does a lot of good things, but making it so you don't have to be poor to, to get on it. Because, you know, it's when you have a disability, you want to work, you want to do all these things, but then you're constantly being put in situations where you have to be choose between working or losing your benefits or, or working or losing your services. So the more we can do that and the more people can advocate with us to increase the funding levels of these programs, the more helpful it will be. And if you're interested in getting involved with me and Jacob, the, um, like I said, we're the Atlantic Center for Independent Living. You can find us on the internet, on Facebook, Atlantic Center for Independent Living. Um, and you can get involved in things like this. Because what's really gonna make the change are people like Jacob creating the pressure for change. Because there's a lot of great laws out there like the ADA, but if nobody puts the pressure, nothing changes. It's like, I was fortunate enough to go to law school, and one of the things that we would say in law school, it's like, okay, now it's the law, so now force everybody to enforce it. So, if we can create public pressure where you're at a where you're at a situation like Alice was where really she was just trying to go to the beach and, and now she has to fight to just go to the beach after being basically told why are you going to the beach in so many other nice ways. But there people should know that when you do that, there's gonna be organizations like us and people like Jacob who's got a massive following. That's why I tracked him down to be on my board. He's like a rock star. Um, <laughs> so that, you know, we could get that story out there. And that's part of the reason why Alice was able to get it resolved really quickly, because there was pressure. So we need more situations like that, like what we were talking about, about businesses being labeled and this one's accessible and this one's not, because at the end of the day, these businesses want to make money. And one in five people has a disability. And if you don't have one, if you live long enough, if you're lucky to, you're gonna get one. So people have a vested interest in this stuff working. It's not just the moral thing to do, it's like the self-interested thing to do. So I'm just, I wanna encourage people to get involved. And I love this stuff. I'm so glad there are people like Jacob out there who are really the next generation of, he makes me feel old, we're only 10 years apart, but he makes me feel old. Um, um, but, and who are gonna lead this fight? Because 
that's what's really going to make the change. And I'm sorry to take up time, but please, um, if you have any disability questions, even if you're not in Atlanta County, if you just wandered in here from another county but still need help, I'll try to direct you in the right place. Turn up the heat, right? Yeah. Amen. Any other questions for any of our panelists? quite a few times where you go someplace and they, you know, say it's handicapped accessible and everything. When you get there, they say, oh, well, we were grandfathered in because it was, the Disabilities Act was, what is it, like 26 years, something like that, that it was passed. And that upsets me because people are living so much longer and definitely a lot of people are going to have more disabilities than they had when people didn't live as long either. So they need more accessibility. They want, you want people to have good quality of life. And in order to do that, you want them out there to be able to do things. And when you can't go to these places, even um, like to go to, into the city to like a museum or something like this, there's some places that you just can't get into. Um, or they have lips like, you know, like people in wheelchairs, they can't get over. And if they're by themselves, there's no way. Um, there's quite a few local restaurants here, and you all know them very well, I'm sure. And they have really, they'll have a handicapped bathroom. The door is so heavy, you can't open it yourself. You have to, you know, wait till somebody can come help you. Um, and one of the places is Smithville Inn. Their handicapped bathroom is, it's just, it has a lip to get in. And, you know, I mean, they are an older building and their food is lovely and it's a wonderful place. But for somebody that's in, they could never get into that bathroom, you know. Um, I never go by myself. So usually somebody, one of my friends, good friends, <laughs> will help. But, you know, those things are, you know, happen. Uh, I also had a husband who had uh, MSA, which was a very, um, disabling disease and the only way we lived in two-story house which I still do but the only way we could stay there was to take a home equity loan out convert our garage to a total handicapped suite which thank God we did because now I need it so I can still live there in my same house which I've been there since 1967 so you know I'm grateful for that but I'm still paying for that addition, so, you know, because it was very, very expensive. I have a ramp to get in my house, which is perfect because he was in a total wheelchair, and I could, I have a shower. I can wheel my, the wheelchair for him in. Um, I can walk with my walker into it, so that's no, not a problem. But you know, uh, I was fortunate enough to be able to do that in order to take care of him, and now I can use it. But so many people don't have that advantage. And I feel for them, I really do, because of different experiences, you know, that I've had, that Marie's had, um, trying to travel, that's a whole nother story, you know. And that really needs to be addressed too. I Absolutely. I agree, the airlines make enough money. They can accommodate themselves. Yeah. yeah, they can do something. Yeah. Well, right. Um, I did a lot of I did a lot of thinking this week about our friend Jacob. Um, you know, not only is he, is he uh, very funny, not only does he have a lot to say, and anybody who, uh, who Jacob has their phone number knows what I'm talking about. <laughs> but above all, above all, it's very important that Jacob has something to say. Because I thought, you know, who in history has done what Jacob is setting out to do? Uh, and and I, I immediately thought of Ralph Nader. Uh, right, Ralph, Ralph, yeah, Ralph Nader. Ralph Nader uh, wrote a publication in the 1960s, Unsafe at Any Speed. And it was about the automobile industry uh, not having the proper 
uh, uh, standardized safety equipment to be saving people in, in car crashes. Things like uh, crumple zones, uh, things like airbags, things mm. like seat belts. And we're not even talking about the seat belt. He then, in the, in the 70s, once he got uh, seat belts standardized, went after the uh, off shoulder belt. Uh, because the lap belt wasn't enough and went after the airbag. And these were, these were things that, you know, the, the, the auto industry was like, listen, we would, the consumer is never going to accept the added cost to a car uh, uh, because of an airbag or a seat belt. And look at us today. Uh, today I drove down from New York and it was incredible because I actually got dressed for this. <laughs> on the Garden State Parkway, because my car is equipped with a, a, a semi-autonomous driving technology. And, and you think about the advances made in just a few years with Ralph Nader. And you think about, well, well what, are the, what are the two things that helped Ralph Nader uh, make the car, the American automobile, a safer place to be? And the first thing is standardization you know, seatbelt laws, that any car that's going to be sold in the United States has to pass a, a certain, you know, you, 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 we often, as Americans, uh, 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 we travel to Europe and we see the little cars and we stand next to them and we make fun of them, you know, because they're little and, and we're big. And uh, uh, you think, well, why don't they sell these cars in the United States? They don't sell them in the United States because the United States has a standardized crash test that we put all, all automobiles through before they're, they're allowed to be sold to the consumer. In the United States, we do testing on things like uh, the, the, the structure of the seats themselves and the seat belts. And you think about all these advantages. Well, what was it? The rollover. Sta Remember the rollover? Right? The rollovers. Uh, 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 standardized uh, uh, standardization. So... Uh, you know, a, a homologation of all the, what the ADA is looking to achieve, uh, uh, that it's nationwide uh, or, or uh, maybe one day worldwide uh, standardization for accessibility. And the second thing that Ralph Nader had was accountability because he was able to go to the New York Times and put it in the paper that this is what, this is what the, the CEO of General Motors, the biggest car company in the world, this is what he has to say about airbags. This is how little he cares about your safety. And to be able to, to then take something like the ADA, like uh, uh, you said, uh, we have the laws, now we just have to enforce them. Uh, uh, to take something like that all the way and hold accountable not only the uh, public places, the government-run uh, uh, places in this country, but the private stru uh, uh, structure as well. Dave brought up a great point, was, was that to have some sort of application like a, like a restaurant review or a health code review that would allow people to discern uh, how accessible a place was and choose against that place like the Smithfield Inn uh, uh, when, when choosing a place just to go out uh, and enjoy, enjoy time with their family. Jacob mentioned before that he was in, on vacation. He was in Massachusetts at the, uh, the Texas Roadhouse. And the, the end of that whole thing was they got him a table, but then he was in the way the whole night. You know, and, and how, how embarrassing. How, how, you know, how does, it, how does a place... That's a national chain. We talk about a, an accessible Dunkin' Donuts. Every Dunkin' Donuts should be accessible. It's 2022. This, this business makes billions of dollars off of wet beans. You think, you think, you would think that at this point, they'd have thought of everything. I mean, they'd have thought of every damn thing to, 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 to blend into a cup of coffee and every flavor under the sun to sell us on and give us all diabetes, but they haven't thought uh, about accessibility. So accountability and standardization, and I think that that Jacob Hackett is the Ralph Nader of his generation. He's going to get this done. There you go. That's, that's hard to live. Uh, that's hard to beat, right? Well, uh, we want to be respectful of your time. And it's, it's moving on 840. So uh, our panel is here if you'd like to stay afterwards and continue this conversation. But we want to be respectful of your time if you do have to go. And I think it's only right to give the last words to Jacob. Well, my friends, as I wrap this up, thank you for being here. My message is simple. If you see something wrong with accessibility, say something. 
Wake the heck up. It's time to get something done. And before I leave you today, I would like to invite my committee up here, because I have a little something for you. Committee members, Barbara Sabbath. Yeah, they know who Frida, they are. Nema, Linda, please come up. We have been working for months putting this together. Thank you, committee members. Zoom meeting every week for the last couple of months, and uh, all because we love Jacob, and because this is an important conversation to have. And as fellow human beings on this planet, we are called to care for each other, right? And this is how we do it. All right. Yeah, yeah, take, take. Yeah, yeah, that would be easy. Thank you from Reverend Dave and I for putting up, putting up with us for the last however many months on Zoom. I mean, they, they, uh, w w were uh, quick to, whenever I had a question, text me. They, they were a huge help. So without them, this would have never happened. Thank you, committee. <laughs> I have to thank some other people here, too. Without my panel, without the many years of friendship, I would have been lost without all all of you, from Stephanie to help me contact the guys to everybody else. Thank you for all you've done, and this is a little something from me. Now the guys, do you want a flower? Guys, <laughs> guys, would you? And Reverend Dave, thank you from me for putting a, for uh, helping me put this together. <laughs> well, and uh, and as the very first slide said, this is the first annual conversation on accessibility because we're going to do this again, because there are endless topics in this conversation. So next year, or maybe even in the fall, we'll be here again having the same conversation, but with new topics and uh, talking about new people. Most importantly, this is about people, right? And so we'll be here again. Thank you all for coming, and we hope you get home safe. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you guys. Get a picture with Don. All right, yeah. we may have to run out. I have to go, my mom's here. Oh my God. Yes. Let's see, do I? Have to... <laughs>